June 2015 topic for NJFL and NSDA Public Forum Nationals is resolved, the benefits of First Amendment protection of anonymous speech outweigh the harms. This is not a constitutional law topic in the sense that it's X case, such as McIntyre versus Ohio Elections Commission was correctly or incorrectly decided, but it is a topic about constitutional law. The reading for the topic is still going to quote a lot of cases, a lot of associated testimony, a lot of amicus briefs, a lot of majority decisions, a lot of dissents. Though so it's not a question of what the Constitution should say, or even what it does say, so much as the benefits versus harms of it saying what it does, as interpreted through the lens of the last couple centuries of precedent. It's kind of a cumulative capstone topic for seniors, especially. It contains elements of the birthright citizenship topic, it contains elements of the Citizens United topic, it even contains some elements of the Voting Rights Act topic that can all come in handy in interpreting this the way that you want to interpret it. That said, the real question that this topic is asking is who are these benefits to or for? Because until we know that, we can't really weigh them against the harms. Are we talking about the benefits to the speaker, the benefits to the listener, the benefits to the general population, or the benefits to the government, and of course the harms to the commensurate entity, because otherwise it's very hard to weigh one of these against an unlike quantity on the other side. So first you have to figure out which of these is the most important. Choose this carefully, this necessitates some preemptive weighing on your part. Most of the implicit con literature on this topic isn't actually a question of First Amendment rights. Generally speaking, people's ability to not listen to the speech, the speech already being unacceptable under the First Amendment, the speech being something that can be restricted by terms of service, by private actors, generally solves a lot of the common things that most con teams bring up on this topic. Generally speaking, when you're talking about competing free speech interests, the platform's rights trump the individual's rights. So for instance, if I own a company and I do not want my workers saying something on the job while they're representing my company, I have a right to speech that I can use so I want my company represented, and I can have a code of conduct that restricts speech accordingly. Similarly, an entity like Facebook or like Twitter has the right to not host speech that it doesn't want to host. The First Amendment does not protect your right to have a Facebook account or to keep whatever you want posted up on Twitter if the company decides they want to take it down. Now, unless the con team is willing to oppose the free speech component of the First Amendment entirely, the rounds probably decided on the margins of speech that wouldn't be legally constrained already, so imminent incitement, malicious false statements, threats, obscenity, etc., if it weren't anonymous anyway. I really don't recommend that Khan take that route. Um, the shock value of having an unconventional case like that diminishes later in the tournament, especially with double eliminations, especially because it's just kind of a crutch versus weaker teams at any given tournament. And pro teams can still argue that as long as First Amendment speech protections exist, then they may as well be extended to anonymous speech unless Khan has a unique reason that it's bad in a world of other First Amendment speech protections. And what I mean by that is that unless the Khan team can show that this speech only becomes bad when it is anonymous, then pro can argue, well, there's a compelling state interest to regulate it whether or not it's anonymous, but there shouldn't be reason to not protect anonymous speech specifically. Because the Bill of Rights is predominantly negative rights, because the First Amendment is entirely a collection of negative rights, all speech is allowed by default until the government attempts to restrict it. This means that teams might spin protections specifically as instances of past legislative restrictions on anonymous speech, which have been found unconstitutional because they violate the free speech clause of the First Amendment, and that any speech that the First Amendment allows that hasn't specifically been threatened by legislation before and then found to be protected under the First Amendment should be outside the scope of this debate. This is a way that teams on either side, but mainly con teams, might want to limit the debate. If the con team can argue that, well, nobody would ever say that that kind of anonymous speech 
should be outlawed, then they can say you don't get to weigh that benefit as pro because it's not actually under First Amendment protection. It's just naturally there. First Amendment protection applies specifically to attempts by the legislature to pass a law abridging the freedom of speech. Now, if the resolution was benefits of further First Amendment protection, then Com wouldn't have to argue against current areas where anonymous speech receives the same treatment as attributed speech. This isn't just about the federal government, though. Many amendments in the Bill of Rights and later on have what's called selective incorporation, which is to say that some parts of them restrict what the individual state governments can do as well. And the first example of this was Gitler versus New York back in 1925, which was about the First Amendment being restricted because of anti-government sentiments and incitements to overthrow the government at some vague future date. And the way the case played out, they still didn't find in favor of Gitlow, but it wasn't because of the First Amendment. They said the First Amendment did apply to the state of New York as much as it did to the federal government. And this is because the 14th Amendment extended other amendments that were written previously and adopted previously to apply to the states and to local governments as well as to the federal government. So the best known example of this is probably Gideon versus Wainwright, which was in 1963. It's the best known example, but it's only about the 14th Amendment rather than about the first being incorporated because of the 14th, and it's three years later than the first amendment equivalent we really care about, which is Tally versus California, which was in 1960, when Tally distributed anonymous flyers that California said and that Los Angeles said were not allowed under local ordinances. And one of the more important quotes from the majority decision on that was, there can be no doubt that such an identification requirement would tend to restrict freedom to distribute information and thereby freedom of expression. Anonymous pamphlets, leaflets, brochures, and even books have played an important part in the progress of mankind. And of course, mankind instead of humankind because this was 1960. And the basic idea behind this was identification requirements place a burden on speech that creates a chilling effect. And that's an argument that's going to come up a lot. A chilling effect is just being discouraged from speech because of the consequences associated with it. So the question becomes, is more speech always better? And if it's not, who should be able to decide which isn't and why it's not? So even if people agree that a lot of anonymous speech may be on balance worse than a lot of attributed speech, that doesn't mean that the government should get to block anonymous speech or discourage people from it because a lot of this speech has consequences when it can be attributed to someone that might otherwise stop the free flow of information from getting out. And the general idea on the pro side is more that of the marketplace of ideas that these bad ideas will be largely ignored and these good ideas, even if they are few and far between, need this protection to grow, to become mainstream. Almost every idea was unpopular and fringe at some point before it got explained, before it made sense, before people decided to actually adopt common sense as common sense with apologies to Thomas Paine. This then led to being cited fairly heavily in McIntyre versus Ohio Elections Commission, which was in 1995. It's probably the most relevant case to the topic, though there certainly have been others since that are also almost as relevant and timely. So this one dealt specifically with anonymous campaign pamphlets, specifically with the ability to influence political speech without having one's name attached to it. And the Supreme Court did a lot of weighing in this. And what the majority decision came up with here was that the interest in having anonymous works enter the marketplace of ideas unquestionably outweighs any public interest in requiring disclosure as a condition of entry. That's not my wording. That's the Supreme Court's wording. Yes, there are probably some former debaters on the Supreme Court. There were then as well. That said, when you've got explicit weighing like that, things start to look pretty grim for the Khan team. So how do we come back from that? Well, there's a couple things that Khan can do. The first thing is just obviously look at the dissents. Very few of these decisions were unanimous. 
At that point, there are certainly people who saw state interests leaning the other way on each of these and who can also be quoted as qualified sources. Aside from that, just because the Constitution mandates it doesn't mean that it's necessarily something that's being done on a net benefit position. It's not necessarily because the judges are utilitarian Benthamites. It's more just because the judges are saying, well, this is what the laws say, not whether the laws should say that or not. So at that point, the Khan team can certainly argue that even though there is a philosophical reason for this from a strict benefits versus harms standpoint, the pro hasn't met their burden of showing that the positive good this creates is actually manifesting itself rather than that on a philosophical level, we feel that we should allow this whether or not the benefits outweigh the harms, and that is a very easy crossfire trap for pro teams to walk into if they are not careful. Another thing that Khan can do is take this beyond literal speech, which at first seems to favor Khan, but also allows pro to do a lot of other interesting things later on. So, I said earlier this does kind of go back to the Citizens United versus FEC topic that we had a few years back. And one thing that can be done here is the con team can say, because of cases such as Buckley versus Vallejo, we've got a situation where campaign contributions are considered to be speech. And the harms of anonymous campaign contributions, which most teams have already backfiled out, outweigh the benefits of various anonymous angry people on the internet not having to use their real names. And this kind of links into a cost-benefit analysis of anonymous speech in elections. But the trouble is that leads us to other things which can also be considered speech but are not actually the spoken or written word. And the trouble is, under First Amendment jurisprudence, voting is definitely considered speech. And if you go back to Talley or to McIntyre, then basically this means that Pro ends up defending that the right to anonymously vote is more important than pretty much anything else, and really defending the bold, controversial, edgy stance that being allowed to not tell your employer, your sheriff, your mayor, whoever else, whether you voted against them is important, and that being forced to disclose votes would have a net harmful chilling effect on free speech. They can also look at a circuit court case coming out of Colorado, which specifically says that it is in question whether or not the First Amendment does guarantee a right to anonymous voting, so it can't be framed out as easily as the Khan team might like. If Khan wants to make this go away, the simplest way to do so is probably going to be to say that voting isn't technically anonymous in the first place because you have to register for it, but at the same time, there's registration process involved with publishing things, there's registration process involved even with an anonymous email account. So whether or not that makes it not anonymous is certainly up for grabs. It can become a very messy framework debate, but it's one that Khan might have to have if the protein talks about voting because the benefits of people not knowing how you voted and being able to vote your conscience without consequences to your job or how you're treated by the government is kind of important and kind of easy to outweigh. So at that point, we've got a topic, kind of like the TOC topic, in terms of where speaking order is going to matter less than side choice. When possible on this topic, you would like to be pro. If you have to speak first, so be it. At that point, you're usually going to end up either with a team who chooses the speaking order first and that lets you choose to go pro anyway, or you have to pick pro and end up going second, doesn't particularly matter. There are structural advantages to going first. They are not as numerous or as big as the structural advantages of speaking second, but they do exist and you should be aware of them and you should use them. At the same time, if you are con and pro wants to limit the topic to literal speech, you do not have to disabuse them of that notion. 
you probably want to try and take advantage of your increased familiarity with these kinds of nonverbal speech that Pro does not have familiarity with. We haven't had a topic about voting in that sense. We have had a topic about campaign contributions in that sense. Increased familiarity can make up for just not so strong arguments overall. The biggest thing for Khan is also just to make this not a topic about what the Constitution says we must do, but what would be more beneficial to do. And that this topic is not about whether the Constitution should change to allow that, but simply a case of utilitarian benefits versus harms. If you have any other questions about this, feel free to leave them in the comments. I will be at Nationals, but I will be in World Schools Debate land rather than Public Forum land for the bulk of the tournament. So questions that you have are probably better left online here, and I will try and get back to them in a timely manner. If there are enough to make a follow-up, I will make a follow-up for whoever needs it. Best of luck in Dallas. Hope to see you all there.